Well, listen, this morning, we are finishing up the sermon series we've been teaching on living upright in an upside down world. And it's, it's been a great series. I've enjoyed it. I've actually learned more than I, I knew already. And how many of you know that's a good thing? We're ever to be learning. And, and I, as I recap this whole thing this last week, I, I tried to, as I often do, put myself in the position of those who are literally right there face to face with Jesus. And this new rabbi is coming on the scene and he's already called some of them and says, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they're excited. They're thinking that this might be the Messiah who's going to come and he's going to bust the Roman Empire. And the Jewish culture and the Jewish people will finally have that land flowing with milk and honey and it'll be wonderful, they'll be in charge and, and here comes Jesus on the scene and he seems to fit the bill. And he begins to teach them in Matthew chapter 5, what we often call the, the Beatitudes. If you haven't been with us, um, check us out on YouTube, check us out on Facebook. I think we got all that stuff now where you can go back and look at the sermons. But he begins to teach them some things that we have labeled as upside down things. Things that don't make sense. Things that just in our understanding and in our thought process are kind of upside down. And they are because these are kingdom values. These are, these are kingdom virtues. These are things Jesus was heralding out saying, behold, behold, you want to be blessed? Do you really truly want to be blessed? And he begins this discourse, and I want to read to you, just recap, verses, starting at verse 3. He says, you want to be blessed? Here it is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I picture these guys sitting around with this big smile with their chest out going, yeah, we're going to do it now. And, and Jesus begins to read these blessings. And he goes on and he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And I picture myself in that crowd with my continents excited, being excited about this Jesus, and he's teaching these things, and we just can't wait for these powerful words to come out of his mouth. And as he continues to speak, I can see my continents and everybody around me going like, ah, poor in spirit. I got to... I got to forgive? I got to show, does that even mean the Romans too, Jesus? And I'm thinking all this in my mind and I'm waiting for this crescendo. I'm waiting for this climax because there's got to be something more to this. And in verse 10 through verse 12, here it is. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow, talk about taking a pin and popping the balloon. <laughs> You're like this, this Jesus, wow, awesome Messiah. And all of a sudden, he, he gets to this crescendo of his, of his sermon on these attitudes that, that a follower of Jesus would have, these virtues that would, would permeate from a believer's life. And they're not what we expected. Persecution? Reviling? Speaking false things i mean jesus is saying okay guys you're following me that's great and by the way and by the way as true followers of christ we will suffer persecutions we will suffer revilings we will suffer people speaking falsely against us now, i realize this isn't a shout hallelujah amen but that's okay it's the word of god and the word of God speaks to us. I can imagine for them, 
it being very strange. But I fast forward 2,000 years, and for us, it's extremely strange. You might say it's upside down. The narrative of the Christian Western church today is a prosperity gospel. Come on, y'all know I'm talking the truth. It's a prosperity gospel. You follow Jesus, and everything will be okay. You you follow Jesus and, and your bank account will be filled. Let me remind you, you go to work and your bank account will be filled, okay? You follow Jesus and you won't ever get sick. Unless, of course, you don't have enough faith. If you follow Jesus, it's all gonna work out. You're a, an American Christian. And that's what we've heard, at least what I've heard. That's what we've been presented. And if we don't dive into the scripture, we'll see that it's a completely different. It's really upside down to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus had a promise here, and it's not the promises of the temporal earth. Does God want to bless you? Yes. But this isn't the blessing that I read here in the Beatitudes. I see a blessing here in the Beatitudes that is completely different. I see a blessing in here that Jesus says, I came not to make life easy for you, but to make you new. To make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you choose that path, you will find persecution. If you choose that path, you will find suffering. And I can picture those around him as we do today. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean, Rabbi Jesus? I thought you were the Messiah, and and our Old Testament tells us that the Messiah rules with an iron fist, and he's going to come and do all these things. And today we say things like, well, what do you mean, pastor? What do you mean, church member? Why do you go to church? I mean, if God can't help me out, who can? I mean, after all, he's God, right? And if he's God, then then why do we got to suffer persecution? I mean, if he's the king of all kings, why can't he he tell this, this judge to not Give me a ticket. And by the way, we're going to read in a moment. Sometimes we suffer persecution and it's our fault. Hello? Okay. If, if you're driving down the road and you're eluding p- police, you're going to suffer persecution. And it's not from Jesus. Okay. That's all you. Don't put that on Jesus. If you decide to give one of your favorite fingers to somebody while you're driving down the road and they run into you, it's not on Jesus. All on you, bro. All on you. But... That's not the type of suffering that Jesus is talking about here. And I can picture these guys saying those those very things. Well, if I follow Jesus, isn't everything going to work out? My financials, I mean, I'm I'm paying what I, my tithe, I'm doing, I'm giving, I'm I'm going on a missions trip. How come it's not working out? The scenario, the, the addition doesn't seem to be working for me. And again, Jesus gives us a blessing and it's not the blessing of this world it's a blessing of a kingdom it's when we live out these kingdom values when we live out these kingdom virtues when they become part of our dna of who we are as believers in christ and maybe you're not a believer in here today and that's okay we want to give you opportunity too and i want to give you an opportunity to let you know that in that decision you're going to be persecuted You're going to suffer. People are going to say falsities about you. You ready to join? Huh? Come on, sign me up. Amen. Hallelujah. There's an answer to this type of suffering. And it's twofold. And the first one is this. As the church, we are called to be the consciousness of our nation, of our society, and of our communities. Let me say that again. As the church, we are called to be the conscience of our nation, of our society, and of our community. Let me read to you a Webster's definition of conscious. It says this. It's the inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motives, impelling one toward a right action to follow the direction of conscience, or the dictate, excuse me, of conscience. The complex of ethical and moral principles that controls and inhabits the actions of people. I guess I should put my glasses on, huh? 
Praise God. Is it on the screen? <laughs> I can just look at the screen. You know what? We often forget those guys back up there in the crow's nest, but they are awesome people. They make me, they make me look good. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Asa. In other words, to put it down in layman's terms to help me understand it, when the church is the church, right is praised and wrong is condemned. Let me say that again. Right is praised and wrong is condemned. That even means when you're doing wrong. You see, the problem of this world that everybody has, we're, we're all subject to it, it's a sin problem. All of us, it's inherited. And in order for our DNA to change, the only one that can change that is with a blood transfusion, and that's Jesus. He's the only one that can help everyone. But here's the problem, and here's the very simple reason we suffer. The world doesn't like the voice of a conscience. They don't like to be told sin is wrong. They don't like to be told that life is precious. They don't like to hear that, that living with someone outside of marriage is not part of God's will. They don't like to hear that, and sometimes it's because of the way we present it. You know, we're called to speak the truth, but Ephesians tells us to what? Speak the truth in love. And that's where we get messed up. Speaking the truth in love and in grace, having every conversation be redemptive in nature. Sometimes, church, we forget that. But the world doesn't like that. The world is not interested in that troublesome voice of conscience. It never has been, and it never will be. But we are called, look at your neighbor and point, it's okay. You are called to be the church. To speak against right things and to speak against wrong things. And that, my friends, is the reason we suffer. They don't like to hear about sin. Listen to what 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 2.19. It says, if we shine our light, this is me speaking, if we shine our light, we're going to have trouble, grief, and suffering. And here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2.19. For, for this finds God's favor. If because of consciousness towards God, someone endures hardship and suffering unjustly. You look through the book of 1 Peter, you'll see eight times where he uses that word persecution or suffering. And what he's saying in this particular uh, crossroads is he's saying, listen, if you stand up for Christ, you're going to get persecuted. It's not going to be just in kingdom eyes, but, but it's okay. You're going to be okay. Isn't that reassuring? <laughs> Isn't that comforting when somebody puts on your Facebook post how you're an idiot for being a Christian and how in the world can you believe that stuff? Isn't it comforting or shouldn't it be comforting? These words of 1 Peter, for this finds God's favor. In other words, there's a prize attached. Matthew said, and we'll get to it here in a little bit, there's a reward in heaven attached when we are treated unjustly. Doesn't scripture say that even Jesus was? And if they treat the teacher that way, how are they going to treat the students? The same way. If we shine his light, key word, if. We shine his light, if we speak up, if we talk about gospel things. This just is, is about somebody going, you're wrong for doing X, Y, and Z. No, this is, this is us saying, listen, X, Y, and Z are not going to bring you to the life that you're really seeking for. The only one that can do that is Christ. He could take away the X, Y, and Z and make you whole and make you new because, again, he didn't come to make life easy. He came to make us new. A new creature in, creation, creation in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have become new. Think about that for a minute. Think about some of the, the issues that they struggled with, that they suffered with think about some of the disruptions in their life you know if you were a christian back then and you were listening to the words of jesus and 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 acts 2 had already happened and the spirit of god had fallen and you were there with peter that first day where three thousand people got saved and you were reminded about these virtues and these values and these things that that the messiah was saying 
and you went to work the next day and you were a stonemason and your job was to make articles for false temple gods? That was your livelihood? That's how you fed your family? What do you do? How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with when, when Christ and Satan clash? What do you do? You're in the middle. They had to endure suffering and disruption in their life and, and, and pain and, and reviling in their social life. What, what do you do when you go to a temple? Paul addressed it to the Colossians and you find that there's meat offered to idols. Do you eat it out of conscious sake? He said, no, don't. What do you do? Because, listen, if we're not in the battle, if we're not clashing, then, then I dare say... I. I I actually strongly say, we're not in it. We're not telling people we're not about the gospel. We're not, we're not calling out the good and calling down the bad. Because as a Christian, we are called to speak up and to speak out. And if we don't do those things, who else is? You see, we are. Jesus left us to be the consciousness of our community, to be the consciousness of Front Royal Virginia. That's where you're at right now. And that's what you're called to be. And when the church is being the church, when we speak up and when we speak out, you will suffer persecution. Praise God. I told you we're going to get some amens on this one before it's all over with. And you got to understand something. The people that he was talking to understood a different kind of persecution than what you and I probably will ever experience. They understood that, that their social life and their, their work life and even their home life you came home and you told your, your husband or your spouse that, that you met this man today at a well and he told you of things that, that you had never known before and he must have been a prophet and he talked about the Messiah. Your husband or your wife would look at you and say, are you an idiot? We, we, we follow Jehovah. We follow the, the, the principles of the Old Testament. And there was clash in, in family and all those different places. But they, they understood that they understood that persecution would follow this. Now, at this time and for some time after that, the Roman Empire was the superpower. And the Roman Empire was from all the way up from Germany to North Africa, all the way down to Italy, to Great Britain, to France. They owned all of that. They had conquered all of that. Their troops had gone in and conquered that. And there was only one way to keep people unified. There was only one way to, to make the subjects of the kingdom stay unified under Roman law, under Roman guard. And that was they, they figured out to make Caesar, the emperor, divine. He was God incarnate. And as God incarnate, when they went around to all their, their uh, the wars and things where they conquered the people, they said, you can worship any God you want to worship. That's okay. But first, first you have to bow down to Caesar. First you have to kiss the feet of Caesar. In our world today, it's like, first you can be a Christian, but <laughs> you shouldn't be doing all that stuff. That's just too spiritual. That's just too holy. And in there, in there, they said, first, first come to Caesar, bow down to Caesar, and then you can worship this Jesus if you want. And it's almost like what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, if you're writing that down, it's a very familiar passive, passage of uh, scripture. When they asked him what was the most important thing, and he says, he showed him a coin, and it said, do, do we pay taxes to Caesar? And he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. What he was saying was, Yes, pay taxes. Pastor Butch did not say don't pay your taxes. But first, give your homage to God. First, honor God before you honor Caesar. Before you honor the little gods of life, honor the one true and living God. And you see, when that happens, this persecution in Matthew chapter 5, 10 through 12, it happens. When you begin to do that, and here's some of the things that they experienced. These are historical facts, especially in the time of Nero. Uh, historical facts that Nero used to, to tie Christians in his garden. Only fault, only problem, only crime they ever committed was confessing Christ. When the world and Christ came to meet, they chose Christ. They spoke up for Christ. They spoke out for Christ. He would tie them to a stake and pour pitch on them. 
and light them. And they were human torches in his garden. Did it for a long time. They, they threw people in lion's dens. They, they cut off parts of the body and roasted those parts in front of them while they were still alive. You want to talk about persecution. Now, this sounds ugly and gory, but it's true. They would take brass plates and get them coal hot, and they would affix them on the most tenderest parts of a person's body. And their only crime? They stood up for Jesus. They spoke out. John the Baptist, as you know, was put in prison because he spoke out against uh, uh, the government. He spoke out against Caesar. He spoke out against those things. All these things that used to happen as persecutions. And these guys knew that this was coming, that it was a possibility, that following Jesus wasn't going to just cost you some time. It was definitely and quite possibly in that culture going to cost your life. We get a, a rendition here in Scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 in the faith chapter, chapter 11, excuse me. And it says this at the end of this faith chapter as he's going back over all these prophets of old who had done all these amazing things. And he says this somewhere around verse 35. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might attain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Yes, that's in the Bible. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Being persecuted as a Christian today, thank God, is not as it was 2,000 years ago. There are people that are still martyr, martyred for Christ. I doubt that any one of us ever gets martyred for Christ. One account was one of the coolest things they used to do was they would take molten lead and they would pour on the back of somebody who spoke out for Jesus and then they would dump cold water on it so they could make it last longer. Talk about reviling, talk about sufferings, talking about pains. 1 Peter 3.14 says this, but in fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Mimicking the words of Jesus, whom Peter walked with, by the way, he was maybe even remembering verses 10 through 12. Blessed are they, blessed are you when they persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. For great is your reward in heaven. When the church stays still, still when the church remains silent, then a society is torn apart. Then the place where we live is torn apart. Didn't you know the church used to be the hub of a community? That's where people went. That's where everybody started their weekend, their weekday. And they went from there. Church was so ingrained in, in, in even our grandparents. Even in my life, I remember going to church three times a week. Did that make me holy, holier than now? In some people's eyes, yes. But no, what it made me was closer to Christ. Because I want to know him. I want to know him. We sang about that this morning. I want to shout out for him. And if you shout out the gospel in your culture, in your workplace, in your home, you know what to expect. You know what to expect. Most likely, you will never die for Jesus, but he, he does ask you to live for him. He does ask you to speak for him. As we, the church, the bride of Christ, he does ask us to speak out and to speak up for him so that someone like you, who didn't know Jesus, can come to find Jesus. Are people going to persecute you for that? Absolutely. Count on it. Bet it. It's a done deal. I mean, think about just in our time now. Let's bring it up to, to, to year 2000. Back in 2016, if you recall, Mark Rubio was running for president. And one of the things they asked him was, because he, he didn't mind saying that he stood up for Christ. And one of the things they asked him was, do you think that your Christianity, that your faith is going to get in the way of you running the presidency? And you know what he said? One of the best answers I've ever heard. Wouldn't you want somebody with virtues and values in the presidency? 
<laughs> Wouldn't you want somebody who has faith and, and, and power in the presidency? And I'm like, man, that is so stinking great. I got to write that down. Because that's a great answer. I mean, just our last two Supreme Court justices, they, they didn't get a bunch of reviling. They weren't spoken falsely against because they were red or conservative or because they were blue and Democrat. They got spoken against because they stood up for Christ. They stood their ground when it came to their faith and they didn't falter. They said all kinds of things about the, the guy beforehand. What was his name? Uh, Kavanaugh. If you watched that thing on TV, which I, I could muster about an hour of it, and the things that they were saying and doing, and why? Because of his faith. And, and the lady that just got confirmed? Yeah, her. <laughs> Brittany knows. Did you see what they were saying? They were so worried that she was going to get in there and reverse Roe versus Wade. That was their biggest argument. They, they, didn't, they didn't care about anything else. They just didn't want them to reverse the argument. And you know what? She as the church spoke up. And she's in place and Brett's in place. And what God's going to do, I don't know. But I know people are in place who don't mind standing up and speaking out for Christ. It happens in our day, church. It's going to happen to you if you speak out. But here's the thing. You're blessed. You have a kingdom blessing coming. It's not that we go out there and say, I want to suffer for Jesus, because if you're doing that, come, we'll give some counseling next week, okay? I'm saying, if you live for Jesus, you're going to suffer. You don't need counseling. You already know it's going to happen. But there's a blessing the first blessing is the kingdom of heaven is yours, not will be, but is yours today, right now. The resources, the power from heaven that seems so far away and sometimes only as far as those tiles as that's where our prayers go, they're yours available today. Will God lead you? Will he guide you? Absolutely. As you are the conscience of our community and of our nation. Let's live out and be truly blessed by Jesus. Let's seek kingdom blessings. And secondly and lastly today, this type of suffering that we're talking about, this type of suffering that Matthew 10 verse 12 is talking about, that you'll be persecuted, that you'll be reviled, spoken evil against, falsities, all these things bring us closer to God. These type of sufferings bring us in close companionship with God. Jesus said this, uh, I think in verse 11, when these things happen for my sake, when they happen because of me, in other words, if somebody is picking on you because of me, don't forget, I'm, I'm the big guy in the sky. Hang in there. And all through the New Testament, we're told these. We're told to, to trouble not, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Don't be troubled uh, all through the, the gospel of John. Let not your heart be troubled. I, I mean, it's just amazing that he just keep, kind of keeps saying that and saying that. If you get a, a concordance and you look up the word troubled or persecute, you'll see that it's several times in the New Testament. And as you read those scriptures, and I hope you do, you realize that it's not a persecution that is an eternal persecution. It's a temporal. And it's temporal because when we speak up for Jesus, He's always there with us. We're never closer to Jesus than when we suffered as he did. You know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus, if you will, if I may be as bold as to say this, he spoke up and he spoke out and it got him a cross and it got him a death. But he got a reward through that. You. You're the reward. You're the reason that Jesus came and died. Paul had this figured out, I think, in Philippians when he wrote these words. And as we were singing worship today, I just couldn't. This is, this is exactly what Paul was saying on that last song and the second song. He says this in Philippians 3, 10 through 11. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. How many of you would say that? I want to know Christ. Then he goes on to say, 
I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. How many of you want the power of his resurrection? Hallelujah. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what Paul said. That's the way to know Christ. Because the fellowship of his sufferings mean that you're, you're in the game. You're, you're, you're doing the church. You're being the church. He said, I, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in death, so that somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know there's a promise attached to that. And it's found in the text that we first read this morning. There's a reward. There's a reward for your suffering and your persecution. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, verse 1 starts out, it says, let us run the race, um, with, lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us and run the race that is set before us. And verse 2 says this about Jesus, that Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the shame, endured the despising, endured the cross and sits now at the right hand of the throne of God. What was his joy? You were his joy. He came and, and took the shame, took the spitting, took the beatings, took the cross, took the fact that his father turned his back on him, which we could never understand in a millennium, turn his back on him, yet he did all that for you, for me. That was his joy. And you know what our joy is? We get to do that too. We get to go out into a world that is hopeless and helpless and bring hope and bring grace. We get to go out in a world that hates one another so much that we can bring peace the joy set before me and you, this, this great reward in heaven is going to be, I believe, somewhere in heaven there's going to be a room, a mansion, Jesus says, and all the people you have affected with the gospel, all the people you have shared the blood of Jesus with, all the people that, that you may never see, some of you are going to give today towards Honduras and I appreciate that, you're going to go down and you're going to save lives literally and hopefully and prayerfully, spiritually. The actions that you do change lives. That's, that's why I do what I do. The joy set before me, the joy set before you, we get to tell people about a God that loves them and cares for them and forgives them. And maybe you've never heard those words. But let me tell you this morning, there is a God that loves you. There is a God that cares for you. But Pastor Butch, put your butts away and sit on it. There is a God that will forgive anything you've ever done. Oh, I'm still in the middle of it. Well, you know what he says? He says, stop. Lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you and run with endurance the race that is put before you, fixing your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's the joy that we have. You are his reward and our reward our reward is not only now being so close to him in companionship because we suffer and we have a joy coming, but there are going to be people that you are going to affect. And I love the verbiage in verse 10 in Matthew. In the, in, in the New King James Version, it says, be exceedingly glad. And that whole was a phrase there in, in, uh, in, in, in that language. And the phrase basically means leap for joy. Leap for joy. We can be leaping for joy. You know, that's why people do this, I think. When people curse you, when they put nasty Facebook posts about you, when you stand up and speak out for Jesus and people say you're an idiot and a an Nathanderall, you can do this. Praise God. A couple years ago, my wife and I were visiting our son in Colorado and we went to the Rocky Mountains and we, we went up to this place and it was just amazing. I mean, it's, it's Shenandoah National Park on steroids. I still think we live in the most beautiful place in the world though. And, and, and there was a challenge because I saw this sign that said this summit was at 12,000 feet. I'm like, <laughs> I've never walked 12,000 feet high. That's like really high. I told my wife, I said, I gotta do it. She said, okay, so 
lovingly, she waited in the car because I didn't know how long it would take me to get up there. So I'm walking, and I'm weary, and I sit down a couple times, and I'm drinking my water, and it's getting cold, and the air's getting thin up there at 12,000 feet. It really does. But there was this rock that said 12,000 feet. And when I got to that rock, I'm like, yeah, I made it. I did it. And I could look around. And I could see the beauty of creation at a position I've never seen it before. And it was amazing. And I'll carry that view as long as I have memory. It was just a beautiful view. And I believe that's what it's going to look like when we get to heaven where we can be exceedingly glad that we have spoken truth and life into people. When we get together, when we have this kind of service in heaven, what's it going to look like? I don't know, but I'm going to ask if Dorney can lead the worship. I think he does a great job. <laughs> Listen, in closing this morning, just, just to recap this whole thing, I want you to understand I don't want you to leave out of this room and say, well, I'm never going to struggle as a Christian because you are. But I don't want you to say that there's no reward and there's no reason for that because there is. And the reason, first and foremost, is because we love God. Why? Because he first loved us. And so that we could take that love and that forgiveness to a community that's around us and lovingly speak the word of God into the lives of those who are influenced by, by our circles that we are in. And so I say to you today, go out and be the church. Go out and speak up and speak out for Christ. And don't do it belligerently. And don't do it as you're all that and a bag of chips. Do it in love. If you find someone sinning, graciously come around them and Ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. Look to the word of God and he'll give it to you. And there'll be a joy, a joy that you could never experience. Anyway. There's a blessing that you can't get from any other type of gospel, which is no gospel at all, according to Galatians. There's a joy that is yours, reserved for you and available now. You know, he ends this whole thing. He says, and it's kind of a strange way to end it. He says, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What does that mean? Who were the prophets? Well, we read a little bit about them in chapter 11 of Hebrews, but what was a prophet? A prophet was an oracle or was someone who spoke God's word. God spoke to them. They spoke to people. And God is saying, your, your station as a believer is going to be that like a prophet. You speak the word of God to people. And some of the things they experienced, you will. But, but guess where they're at now? There's a great cloud of witnesses that surround us. That's why we can run with endurance, the race set before us. So let's go out and be the church, amen? Let's go out and not look for persecution, but let's not step away from sin. Would you bow your heads with me? This morning before we continue as the team comes up first and foremost you got to deal with that in you this morning if if you know if the spirit of God has prompted you and touched your heart through this has been kind of a solemn kind of service from the beginning to, to just this moment if there's sin in your life give it to God ask for forgiveness this morning Search your heart this morning. And I give you this promise because he gave it. You're forgiven. Confess your sins and he shall forgive you and make you whole. This morning, if you are kind of in the same camp I'm in, I don't always speak up and speak out. Maybe because I, I don't want to get embarrassed. Maybe because there's all kinds of reasons. Sometimes I don't feel smart enough or holy enough. Sometimes I just don't think that I'm going to have the right words to say. And I, I keep silent. 
and I don't speak up and I don't speak out. Sometimes I don't want to hurt people's feelings so I don't say what really needs to be said. And I'm sure you have your excuses as well. Let's lay those things aside. Let's lay those things aside and let's be the church. Let's be the consciousness of our community through the Word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And let us do, as we sang this morning, be ever so close to Jesus. As Paul said to the Philippians, who, by the way, was in a jail, and his only crime at that moment, he cast out demons of this girl that was making money for this guy. That was his only crime in Acts chapter 16. He wrote this epistle, which is called the joy epistle. He's always talking about joy in that epistle. He wrote that because he knew. He knew the power of the resurrection of Christ and he desired to participate in the fellowship of his sufferings. May that be our prayer, Lord. May it be our prayer today as Paul prayed. Lord, don't let the enemy come in and make us feel bad or ashamed. Lord, your forgiveness is complete. Your word declares that you, you throw it into a sea of forgetfulness and, and I believe you put up a no fishing sign, which means we can't go back and get it. It's done. It's complete. It's finished. But help us to move forward from there, Lord. I pray for opportunities for each and every soul in this place today that we might have an opportunity to speak truth and love into the life of the circles of influence that we are in this week. And I know the enemy's going to say, well, you've already told them about Jesus. Tell them again. Repetition is the key to learning. And for some, it's going to be the key to eternal life. So empower us. Strengthen us. We love you today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.